This is lecture 14, Principles of Metabolism, and in this lecture we will look briefly at some parts of lipid metabolism, namely fatty acids and sterols. So first I'd just like to do a, just a quick overview of, of lipids. We're not going to look very much at lipids at all in, in this course. It's a very large topic. Uh, there's lots of different species in this, in this field. Uh, but uh, we'll just make a cursory overview. So lipids, first of all, are sort of defined as uh, fat-soluble species or species which are hydrophobic. Um, so uh, all of these contain structures which make them averse to water and they tend to aggregate in membranes uh, or in droplets, uh, in lipid droplets. So they have a, that's a, of course a fundamental difference from all the Fat, all the water-soluble uh, metabolism that we have looked at so far. And uh, each compound on this chart is really a representative for a whole large class that can uh, comprise a, a large number of structures. So, so this is a very brief overview of a complicated branch of metabolism. So um, all lipid metabolism, all lipid synthesis starts from acetyl-CoA. And acetyl-CoA can uh, go into two major branches, the fatty acid branch or the sterile branch. And fatty acids is really a, kind of a polymer of two carbon units. So acetyl-CoA is uh, repeatedly sort of polymerized um, to build up this long tail, which is hydrophobic. Uh, and then there's this carboxylate group towards the end, uh, which is uh, charged or polar. So these are what's known as antifatic species. These, this part fits well in fatty sort of environments, uh, whereas this part tends to like water more. Um, and so uh, this is the basic building block of, of, of a lot of the uh, lipids, uh, all the fatty acid containing ones. And the next step is uh, to take two of these fatty acid chains and, and uh, join them to a glycerol group. So then we have something that looks like this. Here, this R kind of groups is really represents a whole fatty acid. So this is really a long tail, and so is this one. So here we have two fatty acid groups that are joined to glycerol as a backbone. This is the, the glycerol part. And glycerol you can obtain as a side product of, from the glycolytic pathway. Um, so that's a kind of an important intermediate. Um, and from this, you can make a lot of products. A couple of the most important are the triacylglycerols. So this just adds another fatty acid chain to one of the uh, glycerol uh, oxygens. Uh, and this is the storage form uh, of fat, as I'm sure you are aware. So this is a very energy-rich molecule that contains uh, three fatty acid uh, tails, each of which can be oxidized for a lot of energy. Uh, this can also be modified to... Um, the glycerol uh, group can capture a metabolite called choline, which uh, generates the phospholipids. And these are different because you have this kind of uh, switter ion, this uh, doubly charged uh, group, which has both a negative charge and a positive charge. Uh, and um, this gives it special properties, which means that it is very good at forming membranes. And uh, this is the major structural uh, lipid in membranes. And there are lots of other types of phospholipids, but this is a common one. This is phosphatidylcholine. Uh, and so up here you have a lot of, of complexity, and, and here as well. You can have all sorts of uh, variations on the fatty acids. They can contain double bonds in different positions. So unsaturation, so you have unsaturated fat. Um, there are also some species which have methyl groups, which are kind of branched. Uh, and all of this can combine in a sort of in a combinatorial way in these larger molecules, so you can have thousands and thousands of different species. But that's the fatty acid branch. Uh, and then the other branch uh, goes from acetyl-CoA via the uh, intermediate hydroxymethylglutaryl-CoA. That sounds complicated, but it's basically this kind of five carbon uh, structure, which has a hydroxy group uh, in the middle here. Um, and um, that particular metabolite is good for polymerizing and forming the sterols. We'll look at this a little bit in detail. Uh, and the sterols is uh, also a highly hydrophobic molecule, so it's considered a lipid, 
but as you can see it's very different from a fatty acid it contains this uh, this um, backbone which consists of these ring structures and a lot of methyl groups over here and then has this kind of tail uh, it's also highly reduced uh, molecule uh, and this can combine with fatty acids and, and make uh, sterile fatty acid esters and it also gives rise to all the uh, steroid hormones and a wide variety of products. So these are biosynthetic pathways. Uh, the uh, fatty acid branches can also, this is reversible, as you see with these double arrows. Um, so of course fat can be oxidized and then you're going in this direction and there are separate pathways for that. And you can also break down phospholipids and membranes. Uh, but the sterile branch is really irreversible. So this is a pure synthesis product and sterols cannot be catabolized for energy. So that's kind of unique with, with this class of molecules. So one thing to keep in mind when you look at lipids is that their physical properties are really the key. Um, so just as an example, the uh, difference between triglycerides and the fatty acids that they are built from really couldn't be larger. So triglycerides are remarkably inert. They really don't react with things. Uh, and for this reason, they are a very good storage form uh, of, of uh, lipids. Uh, and of course, the dipocytes can store phenomenal amounts uh, of triglycerides. And also other tissues can contain quite a bit of triglycerides. So a kind of drastic example of how uh, inert triglycerides really are uh, came from a paper where the um, enzyme that breaks down triglycerides in, in the heart and in, in, in several tissues was discovered. And so in the knockout mouse that cannot break down these triglycerides, you have this phenomenal accumulation of lipids in the heart in this case. So it almost looks like a piece of butter, this, this how, uh, mouse heart. Uh, so lots of triglycerides in this tissue and throughout the tissues of the mouse. But... Uh, Despite this, these mice are perfectly glucose tolerant and don't seem to have any sort of major uh, phenotypes or disorders. Uh, so this tells you something about uh, how sort of benign the triglycerides are. Uh, in contrast, fatty acids are really toxic. And fatty acids is basically soap. Uh, so this is a detergent and it attacks membranes and, and structures, membrane structures very quickly. Uh, and so this is often referred to as lipotoxicity. So these free fatty acids uh, can really disrupt things and you need to have chaperones, carrier, specialized carrier proteins to sort of to, to carry these molecules because otherwise they would they would wreak havoc and cause damage to tissues. Uh, so this is just an example from one study of this uh, lipotoxicity where you see that you can really uh, you can really kill cells by adding palmitate to it. So physical properties are really important. So these are not just different structures. They are very different physical things. So I'd like to look a bit in detail at the fatty acid synthesis pathway. And um, this is because I think it's an interesting example uh, that combines several of the concepts that we have looked at so far in the course. So as we said, fatty acid synthesis is a kind of polymerization process. So it starts from acetyl-CoA. Uh, to a carbon unit, uh, and it repeatedly builds up a long uh, carbon chain by adding these two carbon units together. But even though we want uh, two carbons uh, at a time, we have a step here initially that does a carboxylation and actually adds one more carbon to form three. So there's an ATP-driven carboxylase step. This is an energetically costly thing because we are combining uh, molecules and forming bonds. Uh, and so we invest some energy to make this three carbon species malonyl -CoA. And this uh, thing can then be transferred uh, from the CoA carried uh, form uh, to an ACP carried form. So this is the acyl carrying protein. So this is actually the, um, the fatty acid synthesis enzyme. It's a large complex in, in mammals that uh, has a residue that just can hold on to this, this, this part that is going to become a fatty acid. So the transferase uh, is energetically sort of neutral, but here we have invested some ATP. So that's kind of the first step. Now we'll see why this thing with the carboxylase was a good idea. 
So when we get to the elongation step, so to actually make a fatty acid longer, uh, here's what happens. So now we have a fatty acid bound to the acyl-carrying protein already. And um, this could be at any step, so we just write R here. We have two carbons here, and then there could be some more. Uh, and then we have a transferase here that is going to condense the existing fatty acid with this new uh, malonyl group that we have synthesized. And now we'll see why it's good to have three carbons here. So what the transferase does is, uh, it does what transferases do, it, it transfers uh, a part of a molecule to another, and in this case it transfers this two carbon group, so that carbon and that one, uh, to the new fatty acid, so it becomes elongated. So just here near the actual uh, protein that holds this molecule, will add these two uh, carbons. So now the fatty acid is actually two carbons longer. Uh, and in the same time, the transfer is actually sort of cleaves here, so the carbon dioxide group is leaving. So actually this is an energetically favorable reaction now because we're, we're forming CO2, and that's something that is uh, energetically favorable, so low, uh, low energy molecule, as you remember. So it turns out that by investing energy here and making a three carbon form of this particular structure, uh, this reaction becomes spontaneous. So it's actually that the elongation step is driven by the energy we invest up here. So now we have elongated the fatty acid, um, but it still doesn't really look the way we want. We want it to look like this. Uh, so there should only be one of these keto groups, and, and here we have two of them, so we don't want that. So to get rid of this particular group, we have to invest a bit more energy. We have to reduce this. So now we have a couple of reductases. So these are now redox enzymes uh, that use NADPH. So remember we said that NADPH was the common um, uh, electron carrier in, in biosynthesis and in reductive reactions. And this is a classic example. Uh, so we take our newly formed sort of longer fatty acid, we use one NADPH to reduce this group. So now this becomes a hydroxy group, same kind of thing we see in sugars. Um, and this hydroxy group can now be removed by a hydratase. So this can leave uh, and, and form water. So uh, then we have an intermediate form, which I'm not showing, but there's a double bond there we want to get rid of and we use another NADPH for that, and when that is complete, then we have got rid of this group and we have this nice uh, chain, which is what we wanted. So altogether, this step adds two carbons to a um, fatty acid, and you can see it's quite a feat because we have not only added the carbons here, but we have also taken care of this oxygen we didn't want. Uh, and um, it's kind of an interesting process. As you see, it requires enzymes from several classes. They cooperate together. Uh, the structure is important, so it's held. These intermediates are held by this carrier protein. Uh, and uh, there's a bit of, sort of clever biochemistry done here, uh, using energy early on to drive reactions later on and so on. So I think it's a kind of cool example of, of the concepts that we have been looking at. So that was fatty acid synthesis. I'd also like to look a bit at the sterile synthesis pathway. So as you saw, this was the other kind of major branch of the lipids. So making the, the sterile backbone, if you will, the sterile molecule. So this is a complex pathway. There's, I think, 20 enzymes or so involved in total, and it's sort of has different parts and segments, and uh, I'm not gonna go through all of it, but there are a couple of interesting steps that I would like to highlight. So again, this starts from acetyl-CoA, and in this case we are using uh, three acetyl-CoA uh, to make a six carbon intermediate, which is used in the rest of the pathway. And the first step here is just a couple of transferases. So there's no energy being expended here, we are just transferring groups. So what happens is that these three uh, acetyl groups get sort of stacked onto each other, into a six carbon molecule, the hydroxymethylglutaryl-CoA molecule. So that's a mouthful, so we usually call this HMG-CoA. Uh, and so you can see there's a couple of, of um, acetate 
groups in here. Uh, and a couple of CoA have left, and there's one of the CoA molecules are still here, sort of holding the, the molecule. And now there's a reductase step, and uh, this particular enzyme is kind of famous. This is the target of the statin drugs, the HMG CoA reductase inhibitors. Uh, and this uh, reductase uses two NADPH in, in sequence uh, and reduces the uh, six carbon compound into the mevalonate um, form. And this gives name to the mevalonate pathway. And the CoA is leaving in this step also. So this is kind of the first step. Um, and then we have a couple of kinases that put phosphate groups on this. And there's a decarboxylase that takes away one of the six uh, uh, carbon atoms. And we end up with a molecule that looks like this. And this is called an isopentanyl. So it has this little odd looking form with a double bonded uh, carbon here, kind of double bonded methyl group of sorts. Um, and this is the building block for what's called isoprenoids. And this is a whole uh, class of uh, molecules. So actually, this pathway also provides other species than sterols. There's kind of an, a branch or, or exit point here. And these things are used for different uh, purposes. They're used for some post-translation modifications. And I think we still don't know a lot about these species. Uh, but this exits here. Uh, and then moving on to sterols, what happens is that these uh, isopentanyls are now the building blocks. And again, there's a bunch of transferases. And there's no energy expended here. We're just cutting and pasting like transferases do. Uh, and there's six steps of these uh, transferases so that we get something called squalene. And this is just a polymer of six of these uh, building blocks. So again, you see here that, think about this as a functional group. This is just cutting and pasting. Um, and um, because we have expanded ATP here to get these um, uh, phosphate groups, the transferases can now sort of be driven in this direction because the transferases actually do hydrolysis of the phosphate bonds. Uh, so kind of like the uh, fatty acid synthesis pathway, we have the same theme that we are investing ATP upstream to sort of charge this molecule. And now we have a lot of free energy we can use here and that goes downstream and we form squalene. And so now we have this odd looking kind of polymer. It's sort of like a fatty acid maybe, but it has all these methyl groups and double bonds, so it's clearly different. Uh, but it looks like a fatty compound, and it, and it is. Uh, and what happens now is kind of, kind of cool, I would say. So it turns out that squalene, or actually there's a middle step within epoxidase, but basically it's squalene, um, it can sort of arrange itself in this form. Uh, and when this happens, it's just in a very favorable position for these carbon atoms to just bond together. And when that happens, as you can see, this graphically, you form these rings. So this is just actually a single step. And you might think when you look at sterile that this is really complicated. How could you synthesize something like this from acetyl-CoA? But actually what happens is you synthesize this polymer and then this is just a single step. So that's kind of cool. Uh, biochemists love this reaction, and this squalene cyclization reaction has been studied a lot. So you can find a lot of, of, of literature on it, and there's a long review on how this reaction works. Uh, but then you have the sterol, and that's basically the, um, uh, the major portion of the pathway. So downstream of here, there is a lot of, of reactions that just remove a hydrogen here or there, add a methyl group, do small modifications, but you keep this, this uh, skeleton. You already have the sterile, so to say. And then this branches out, and we start to get to peripheral metabolism now. So this can make all sorts of different sort of minor variants, forms of this, different kinds of sterols and all the steroid hormones and all that kind of stuff. But at this point, it's more like making variants that can be used as different signals and, and so on. It's kind of, we're exiting uh, central metabolism here. Uh, but this is an interesting pathway, I think, to, uh, to look at. Again, it, it combines many of the topics that we have looked at before. Well, that's uh, all I will say about lipids in this course. I hope you got some sense of, of what they are if you haven't studied lipids before. 
Um, I just want to point out one last thing, and that's that all these lipid species that we have been talking about, all these various forms with double bonds and chain lengths and, and whatnot, uh, they are they seem to be functionally specialized. So it's not just a random collection of lots of different types of fats. Um, and the reason for this is that when you look across tissues, it seems like specific lipids are present in, in very specific places. Uh, so this is just some data I'm showing from um, a kind of survey paper that we published a couple of years ago. And um, for some specific lipid species, we know the function. So for example, there are very specific phosphatidylcholines which are present in the lung and acts as a surfactant, and they are specific to the lung, and they're not present in other places. Uh, but for most of these, we have no idea what they do, but if you just look at their abundance across tissues, which is shown here as a heat map and a bar chart, uh, you see that they are very specific patterns of some lipids being present in some tissues and completely absent in others. Kind of look like a kind of checkerboard type of pattern. Um, so we suspect that these lipids have very specialized functions. It's just that they have been hard to study because you know, unlike genes, these are not encoded by the DNA, so they're not so easy to do functional experiments with. Uh, but they probably are uh, more functionally specialized than we think. So lipid metabolism is a large and interesting field.